Welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. It is Sunday, July 10th, 2016. This is episode 1,973,000. I don't know. It's been a long time. I'm your host this week, Matt Dillon. <laughs> Joining me, Tracy Harris. Woo! Hey, howdy. How are you? I'm doing really good. Good. We, uh, we've, I've been doing this show for like, I don't know, 11 and a half years or something, and you've been doing it. It seems like you've done it almost as long as I have. I don't think so. I think I but saw I, you on it. Yeah, I, I, know, I know you started afterwards, but it I seems like two, that. I want to say 2006 was like the first time I was ever on, and I think it might have been you know, somewhere later in the year. We'll just call it a decade <laughs> apiece, just for fun. Uh, uh, this is a live public access television show, only we're not actually on public access so much anymore as streaming live from our wonderful new studios, ACA Free Thought Library, here in beautiful Austin, Texas. And uh, we take live calls, we talk to people about what they believe and why, have conversations, discussions, sometimes heated, sometimes yeah. not, uh, about a number of different topics. And after the show's over, uh, the people involved get together and go to dinner at Threadgills. They'll put the address up right at the bottom <laughs> of the screen. It's three lights down that way, take a left, and, and then it's on your left, a light or so down. It's easy. You'll Nothing find to it. it. Piece of cake. So, you actually have announcements to make on behalf of uh, the ACA, yeah, or at least I guess one. I have one announcement. Yeah, we got our Bat Cruise coming up on September 24th. Um, and so that's a Saturday, and just want to make sure people are aware because we have limited And the tickets space. are actually available now. Yeah, now that's well. what I heard is that I checked before I walked out of the, the meeting and just said, okay, we're good for, for ticket sales, right, if people go to the website, so you can... I was told you can buy your tickets um, at to the 2016 ACA Bat Cruise. And I will make a quick recommendation, and that is that you actually go and buy your tickets uh, earlier because space on this is limited to about, what, 125, 150, something like that? Yeah, there, I think there uh, might be between 150, maybe up towards of 200, but I'd have to confirm that. Well, we need to double check that. I uh, was executive producer for two magic shows uh, yesterday, yeah. and the amount of seats available at the theater were a little bit off, and people waited to the last minute to buy their tickets, and then some people showed up at the door, and we had oversold or sold out, and then uh, had some extra seats available. Well, it's fun. I mean, we have speaker that yeah. usually is there. Like we always have a featured speaker, this and year we've it's got Greta Christina, right? Yeah, yeah, and we've got an award that we're going to be giving out, wow. and uh, I mean, it's just. It's going to be a lot of fun. The speaker, the lecture, I think if, usually if you get the Bat Cruise ticket, the speaker is free, the lecture's free, and you yeah. can go in before the cruise, they have the lecture, and then the cruise is just fun time. So that happens after the talk, um, and everyone just goes and has a blast. You br can bring your own food, bring your own drinks, um, alcohol is allowed, and I don't know, it's just a really good time. I go every year. So yeah, you can go to atheist-community.org. Uh, the new website's up, and, and it looks like uh, there's probably a link there to buy tickets, but I'm doing a show live, and I don't have time to search around for that yeah. type of thing. Do we want to just go uh, straight into callers? We or? do. I, I'm going to quickly be scrambling here to get my blog post up, because I forgot to put that oh. as the co-host. I am required to do a show blog post for this talk thread, so people can go to our blog and comment about the show. So give me a call. So minutes, while Trace is doing her pre-show work, uh, right after we've gone live, uh, I didn't do any pre-show work at all. I don't have any actual requirements other than to show up and talk and take calls. Uh, but we'll start off. Uh, we'll get the ball rolling with Ron in Chicago, Illinois. Thanks for waiting. Hey, what's up, uh, Matt? This is uh, Ron from the uh, about two weeks ago. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about the burden of proof and atheism. As to whether or not atheism is really just a disbelief or lack of belief in God or God. Okay, so here's the problem. That that statement, I want to talk about whether or not atheism is just the lack of belief or disbelief. 
you're going to get different answers from different people. I'm only interested in talking about it with regard to how I use it. If somebody else wants to say that atheism is the, the assertion that there absolutely is no God, I disagree with them on their usage, and I care less about the label and the act than I do about the actual subject we're talking about. So I'm talking so, about, you know, th there, there is a claim that a God exists, and you either believe that or you don't, and what is the default position, and why, and where does the burden of proof rest? Well, the burden of proof lies on the one that makes the claim, but I'm not really trying to get into weak atheism or strong atheism. Is that what you're trying to get at? Well, I just wanted to make sure we're, we're clear that if you're going to start talking about a burden of proof... Uh, the weak atheist position or the, the disbelief doesn't actually put forward a proposition, so there's no burden of proof there. Okay, so do you think that we should just accept what somebody tells us if they say that they just disbelieve rather than paying attention to the conduct of how they carry themselves in the discussion? Ah, so now what we're actually talking about is what people profess that they believe or don't believe in comparison to how they act, right? No, what I'm saying is that the disbelief and God or gods as atheism is not the only definition of atheism out there. I don't, I don't care. I don't know how that's relevant. Yeah, if we're not going to well, discuss weak and, and strong atheism, then why is this <coughs> relevant? No, I'm just trying to say that if atheism, if, if it's claimed that atheism is the disbelief or lack of belief in God or gods, that's not necessarily true. Well, I'm every atheist, every atheist question. disbelieves and, ha and lacks belief in God. Some atheists also believe no gods exist. Yes, some atheists may zealously refuse to believe in God or gods, well, even though I, I don't so even now you're know talking what about something different. Use, <laughs> not use not, the definition of Ron. Ron, <laughs> you, you've talked about like four different things now. First, it was whether or not you believe. Then you talked about things that had to do with the reason why you believe. Then and, and whether or not somebody's just obstinately not believing. Um, then there was also this issue of people say they don't believe, but do their actions betray that? Which one of those would you like to talk about and why? I would like to talk about the definition that you use. On I'm not, I'm not interested in definitions. Like I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in arguing about whether or not people <laughs> agree about the definition of a word. I'm more interested in talking about the actual concepts. Yeah, the concept of theism is the belief in a personal, interactive, creative God behind the influence of the universe. If you're no. an atheist, you're going to be without no. that. Our theism is to be without that. No, right? no. So, no. So, the, so, so you've added you something to theism. Belief, you've already belief, started by adding something to theism that I don't think is justified. There is a proposition, some God exists. If you accept that, you're a theist. Okay. It so doesn't necessarily have to be a personal God. God. Somebody like, could you deny the distinction between deism and theism. No, I'm 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 ex Ron Ron. I'm explaining the distinction between deism and theism. No, no, you just said gods. Theism is a specific belief in God claims personal interactive. No, deism is not interactive God. I, I I understand that. Okay, theism Why is the top level. Ron, can I finish one sentence? Theism is the top level. Deism is below that. Theism is the belief in some God. Deism is a belief of a, a non-interactive, non-personal God. That makes it a subcategory of belief in God. It, if not, what a category is above deism? Where, do you, where are you getting all these categories from? We're just talking about what each position means. If you're a theist, it means a specific thing, and deism means a different thing. Okay, here's where we are. We're talking, we're, Ron, we're arguing about the labels again, and I want to talk about the concepts. Can you get past this? Okay. What do you what do you call I, someone? What I just said. Run. What I what I just run. Said, run. Run. Just run. Concepts. Run. What do you call someone who believes in a god? You call somebody who believes in a god. It depends on what those gods are. No, I mean, okay. It, I, I don't want to get. Theism, right? You I mean, could call somebody who believes in a god a Christian, but you might be wrong. But if you don't know anything about the god other than the fact that they believe some god exists, what do you call them? What is the label for that? Well, if you're talking about the concept or the word or the description of the God, it, it depends. You could be talking about atheism. You could be talking about no. uh, a variety of different things. But we understand what the concept of theism is because I just explained it. It's a personal, interactive, creative God. And I don't I agree don't with your mean. definition of theism. So now what do we do? It doesn't matter what your def if you agree with it or not. Generally, the description is the same thing. Theism is the belief in a personal, interactive, creative God. I don't, and I don't, I'm just saying, I don't agree with that, so now what do we do? Okay, so, the, and so 
what you're basically saying is that if I can change the meaning of a word on spot and ignore the general meaning of words, and there words are no don't have meanings, meaning, right? Words don't have intrinsic meanings. They have usages. And the usage of so different words... So you can words... use a word. What? You can use a word. You can use a word that is not actually what it means. If yes, I... I, I no, 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 no. Ron, no. You're actually an atheist. Ron. Is that... Ron. Okay? Ron. Words don't have meaning. They have no intrinsic meaning. They have usages. And different people yes, use... words change. Can you stop I interrupting? Understand. And words can have different usages at different times for different people. The value comes in, this is what I mean when I use this word, and as long as you and I have an understanding of that, then we can have a conversation. It doesn't even matter if we use it in the same way in other contexts. But okay, we're sitting here spending all this time, we're sitting here spending all this time talking about the labels and not the concepts. And I don't want to have to say it again. Pick a concept and talk about it. I just told you what the concept is. Theism. What did I say? Theism is a label. You asked me about that. Theism is a label. What is the concept behind it, though? I My position, the way I use the word theism, is that theism is the top-level construct that is the label for those who have a belief in a god. Doesn't, okay. doesn't matter whether it's a personal god. It doesn't matter whether it's an interactive god. It's just belief in a god. Okay. You're coming in here making something up on spot. Nobody no, I'm actually not. That description other than a personal, interactive, creative guy. What difference? Nobody even if I was making it up on the spot, what that. difference does that make? It makes a difference because you can't just use a, de a description of something and make something else up about it because somebody's going to be going in the direction on that topic that's inconvenient for you. No, 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 no. You're, right. you're failing you to understand. Ron? You're failing to understand. If you type theism into Google and get the definition that pops up, what does it say? I just did that. It's gonna, it's gonna say. Well, if you said it, what does it say then? Because belief. The, the belief in person. Wait, would you shut up and let me explain it? It says belief in the existence of a god or gods, yeah. especially belief in one god as a creator of the universe, intervening in it and sustaining a personal relationship. Intervening. That's what I just told. It doesn't you. say you that's a see requirement. The word especially. That's not a requirement, a personal, Rod. Ron. Ron. Did you not hear the word especially? Do you understand yeah, what that means? That it means that theism, there's also, there's a comma here. Theism, belief in the existence of a God, that's the minimal. And then there's a comma, and then especially, it is saying the, use, the, the word in general applies to belief in a God, but it is very commonly used to apply to belief in a specific type of God. Right, because it even says, just check this for a minute, see if this helps clarify. It says belief in the existence of a God or gods. And then it says, especially belief in one God. So you know that the definition has to encompass both belief in polythe like polytheistic, which theism for people that believe in many gods, polytheism, right? They're theists and they believe in many gods. So theism is about belief in a God or gods. And then there are, there are subcategories. That's what Matt is trying to explain. Yeah, you know, I know you're looking for the convenient description, but here's <laughs> no, I'm looking at the I, definition. Dictionary.com. Here's dictionary.com. I don't can, give a can, rat's can, ass. That's the point. Ron, you're on hold. I hope you can wow. hear me and that you're not still just talking to yourself because I'm going to be very, very, very clear. Dictionaries are not authorities on what words mean. That is prescriptivist. Dictionaries describe how words are used. So we can sit here and have a dictionary battle until we get to the point where, where you will realize that I've already acknowledged you have a usage of theism that is common. It is not the only usage of theism. I'm talking about the bare bones minimal usage of theism, the one that would be the top level in a set theory diagram of deistic and theistic beliefs. And what I, what I really want to get through is I don't give a shining rat's hairy ass about the label. What is your point about Wait, the concept? Wait, before you put him back on, I'm at dictionary.com and here's the definition. Dictionary.com. <laughs> the belief in one God as the creator and ruler of the universe without rejection of revelation. Number two, belief in the existence of God or gods. So we're right back at what I got out yeah, of Google. It's in the, the same first place. definition we gave you earlier. So there are two usages that are listed in both of those definitions. We're not saying the same definition, and you're getting off a topic with what I came in. <laughs> Goodbye, with. Ron. It's exactly the same definition. They both gave du dual definitions that included generic belief in a god or gods and also um, belief in a single creator god. I don't understand what the pro why this is difficult. I'm getting off topic. Ron, you're getting off the line. <laughs> Next caller.
because I'm done arguing about what words mean. Why is this so hard? I, let me just see if I can be clear. My general usage of theism is somebody who believes in a God. Ron thinks that the only seemingly correct usage of theism is somebody who believes in a personal God who's the creator of the universe, blah, 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 blah. That, by the way, is the God of classical theism. And these are, these are philosophical definitions that are used quite often. Either of them, uh, both of them actually, apply to someone who believes in a God. One is slightly more specific than the other. So at a minimum, I would say that the two definitions should better be categorized yeah. as a top level and then a subcategory. Theism, you believe in a God. Uh, this subcategory of classical theism, you believe in the God of classical theism. Yeah. Then there'd be a subcategory for theism. But yeah. none of that matters. Because the issue that he was going to call into was about atheism and the burden of proof. And the only way that discussion has any value is if you're going to either acknowledge that the non-theistic, weak atheist position has no burden of proof. It is a rejection of a claim that hasn't met its burden of proof. Or if you want to try to claim that atheism is in fact making a claim and then should then have a burden of proof. And I will freely agree, if someone is asserting that there is no God, they have adopted a burden of proof. And they need to meet that burden of proof before you can be justified in accepting their claim. And the same is true for when somebody says there is a God. They've made a claim, they've now adopted a burden of proof, and before belief can be justified, they have to meet that burden of proof. That sentence makes all of this crystal clear. Because if you cannot believe until the claim, or you should not believe until the claim has met its burden of proof, then the default position is to not believe the claim. And so if the claim of theism, the proposition is that some God exists, whether it's a personal God or whatever, those are different characteristics within potential claims, but they all fit under the claim, some God exists. That's it. Whether you think it's personal or not, some God exists is a claim. The time to believe that claim is after it has met its burden of proof. And up until the time that it has, you are an atheist. You are a non-theist. You are a non-theist, an atheist. And it doesn't mean that you are putting forth a proposition. It means that you're not accepting one. I am not yet convinced that a God exists. That's it. And if you want to tell me that when I say, oh, I'm not, I'm not yet convinced that a God exists, that I'm not really an atheist, I'm instead some middle ground thing between belief and non-belief. I don't know. You are very confused about the nature of propositions and burden of proof. But moreover, I don't care. If you want to say you're not really an atheist, I am under the usage that I have, uh, that I'm talking about. Um, and by the way, you don't get to define who is an atheist just like I don't get to define who is a Christian. But. The, the thing is, it, though, it, just using your gumball analogy, this reminds me of how the definition of atheist gets parsed all the time. And this is being parsed, and weirdly, I mean, I'm looking at the definition he was using at the site he says he was at, yeah. and there is the definition you were giving right there in front of me. Yeah. And it, whenever you look up a word and it has a list of definitions, those are all the applicable definitions of the common usage of that term that you can expect to hear somebody say. And it'll tell you if something is an uncommon usage or an archaic usage or, you know, like, um, and what, it, it's like when, I, I noticed this during, indoctrination I think does this somewhat to people where they'll look at something and they can only see it a certain way. Mm -hmm. And they cannot see the rest of it or the other way of looking at it. And it's almost like if you had, um, using your gumballs, you've had a red gumball and a blue gumball and put them down in front of somebody and said, what color gumballs are down there? And they say red. And you say, okay, well, yeah, there's red, but there's blue too. And they say, no, it's, it's red. And it's like, yeah, but there's a blue one too. No, it's red. It's like, but there's a blue one too. And you, there's only so many times you can do that. You can't just ignore the blue one. It's there too. <laughs> so... I mean, well, it's, 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 so the categorization that he's trying for is theism is necessarily belief that a personal God exists. And then there's deism, which is belief that an impersonal God exists. And then you can go on down there. And these are all as if they're at the top level. And I'm instead using something more akin to set theory to say, okay, some God exists. A personal God exists, a non-personal God, th th this branching yeah, hierarchy. Yeah, because, I mean, the, the definition belief in the existence of a God or gods, which was at both the site he was using and at the site that we, that we just hit first on a random Google search, would indicate something that would be an umbrella. So if you believe in a God or gods, it would have to necessarily, any belief in God or gods would then come, fall under that umbrella of a category. 
Cool. I, I mean, I don't know. It was very, that was a weird call. So maybe if Ron can get past the labels and actually come up with a concept that he'd like to talk about, maybe we can try I that again. I should check. I, I think I posted the blog thing. I'm just going to check real quick. So this kind of continues on from here. We've got Carlo in Austin, Texas. Wow, there's a rarity. Yeah, we hardly get local. Hey, Carlo. <laughs> hey, hey. Am I, am I on here? Um, you you're on the air. Hi. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess my, yeah, I guess my question uh, kind of tied into what Ron was talking about, sort of. I mean, so I guess, um, you know, your personal belief is that, oh, well, okay, if this is correct, that, like, you know, you do not, you know, accept uh, the, or the burden proof of the existence of a god, um, you know, hasn't been fulfilled. Okay. Is that correct? Sure. I guess. Um, well, I I guess I was wondering like, what do you think the the what is the, like the societal function of labeling oneself uh, an atheist? Um, when the bulk of society tends to believe in something and you can't see why they do that, it doesn't uh, it doesn't seem to meet its burden of proof. They can't offer good reasons for it, and then that collection that that portion of society gets preferential de facto treatment and the people who are engaged in rational thought and discussion about this are the oddballs who are disparaged from the pulpit. The value in identifying as an atheist is in making people aware that we're out here, that we're not baby killing evil monsters, and that maybe, just maybe, <laughs> our disbelief in the claims that they're offering is actually rationally justified when we expose fallacy after fallacy after fallacy in what is the norm position. It's really a strange thing to wake up, as, if, you know, myself as a former believer, to find yourself in a world mm. where not only did you used to believe something that is wholly unjustified, but the majority of people you're ever going to encounter believe it as well. But, but I think um, when you ask that question of what is the societal function oh, of self-labeling yeah. as atheist, I was, in my head, the first thing I thought was it depends on the yeah. society in which you live. Um, there are a lot of societies where people contact us and say it's really strange to me that you know people actually label themselves as atheists because I'm in some Scandinavian country and everyone here is an atheist and nobody even yeah. talks about it. But it's like Matt is saying, when you live in a society where a lot of people are religious and a lot of that religion is influencing policy and law and education, it becomes important if you're the person that thinks, hey, you know, maybe these uh, religious ideas aren't really enforced by a god and maybe they're not the best things in the world and they're getting a lot of steam behind them because people think this is what God wants them to do. Yeah, I don't believe in Bigfoot, but <laughs> yeah. I don't spend so, much time telling people okay. I don't well, believe I mean, in Bigfoot. Yeah. But if I lived in a country <laughs> where Bigfoot belief was the de facto standard and people were legislating based on their Bigfoot belief and people were maligning those who didn't believe okay, in Bigfoot, yeah. then I would label it myself that way. Right. So essentially then it's like kind of just uh, not agreeing with like an evangelical aspect of like whatever religion exists. No, I guess. So it's, not, it's, not just, it's not just it's not just that. I am opposed to superstitious pseudoscience in all of its forms. It's just that I I label myself okay, in, in okay. response to the most impacting, the, the, for, the, the, the forms that that comes in that has the most impact on everybody's life. Yeah. Christianity is very influential in the U.S. Yeah, okay. The, okay. The, the palm reader down the street, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. they're full of crap. And they're probably doing <laughs> some real harm to people, but they don't have near the impact that religions do. Okay, okay. Does well, that I, help? okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I guess I kind of wanted to Yeah, I did want to yeah, understand that kind of viewpoint because I mean, uh myself personally, I don't really believe in like, you know, a divine or any god type thing, but I wouldn't label myself as like a atheist, I guess. And that's your your choice. I would say under the definition or the usage of atheism yeah. that we've been talking about, you're an atheist because you don't believe in a in a god. Um Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess how you label yourself maybe, is a separate I issue. I just perceive like the yeah, I mean, I guess I just perceive like, uh, like at least in the U.S., like the evangelical aspect of like proclaiming that you're like an atheist. I guess. Oh, you you mean? Which I guess you know it's relative to like you know our you know you know American culture. I guess. Yeah, no, and, and it has so there's a bunch of people out there who think they are the only atheist in their town. They're not. They're the only. They're the only atheist they mm -hmm. know. They don't. Get, yeah. you know, so they they're constantly in the situation whether they're at a family gathering or, or out in public 
where they are, they feel very much like an outsider. Because if, if you go to you know a family gathering and everybody's praying and talking about what they did at church and maligning the the worldly secular nature of you know blah, that yeah. that's not a comfortable place to be. And if you don't have a way to reach out to find the other yeah. people, that's the reason to be out. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. And then, yeah, I guess my kind of second, like weirdo comment that I wanted to put out there was, um, I guess, yeah, for the sake of argument, like I wanted to suggest that enlightenment, maybe in the Buddhist, you know, kind of idea, or really, I guess just enlightenment in general is like, a is a real thing. And by that, I'm, I don't know, I'm con defining it as like, uh, an increase in like critical thought and like you know drawing a metaphor analogy. <laughs> so yeah. I, I get no problem with the idea that critical <laughs> thought is a real deal. Yeah, I mean people get enlightened as far as like learning things all the time. I mean, we had the great enlightenment. Well, uh, that, I, yeah. that's the label we put on a period of time so after I, I we guess... got out of the dark ages. But I, 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 in the Buddhist sense, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that your definition fits, or that I think it's a real thing. Well, uh, well I, I don't know. I've been running this weird, like, thought experiment, and, like, I don't know. And then, like, you know, having these ideas, and then they started kind of, like, paralleling more with, like, you know, I guess Buddhist tradition or something. But, you know, the idea that, you know, uh, physical and emotional pain and fear kind of limit one's ability to uh, basically go into the mind space or be imaginative, which is, you know, critical thought, free association. So, um, hang on. I don't know. This is yeah. something. So, I don't know. I, so I don't pain, know. I guess pain I keeps you from the troll machine. To, yeah, yeah, that's not really what I took away from well, this pain, reading. You know, pain keeps you from using your imagination. Um, okay. <laughs> I could see. Well, I could see a possibility. Well, I guess, I can, like, hang on, Carla. You know, hang on. Yeah. I could see a possibility where yeah, you're sure. trying to exercise your imagination, but you're in so much pain that you are, can only focus on the pain. But that's entirely physical and normal. I don't think that that's necessarily the, what you're well, right. the other thing is some of the greatest creatives in I'm, history I'm, have been yeah. very I'm very um, clinically depressed yeah like like people in tons of pain I mean yeah yeah I what I took away just my takeaway from the the core message of Buddhism was just about don't inflict you know um, unnecessary pain on yourself by getting unreasonably attached to things like if you know if you get your if you get a pet for example be aware it's going to die before you, most likely. So don't get so attached in the vein I mean, of yeah, thinking I, that I that guess... animal will be with you forever because it probably isn't going to be. And so don't set yourself up for, you know, hardcore disappointment in ways like that because that's those sorts of attachments when you have an unreasonable bond with something can set you up for pain that is unnecessary because if you looked at it more rationally, then you wouldn't hurt as much because you'd expect, you'd understand the, the situation and that it's temporal. Well, yeah, I, I guess I'm suggesting um, in the mind, you know, uh, you know, the the conditioning of anticipation of pain, which is, you know, fear, and that those things existing, you know, set of blocks in the mind to not be able to consider a whole argument, like to be able to s consider like both sides of an argument, I guess. Yeah, I think that fear is definitely one of, fear and anger are two emotions that can block your ability to reason well. I'm not gonna say that they always do, but I think in general, they are emotions to be wary of. Like if you feel, fe I had somebody describe it once, um, like a warning light in your car, so when you feel fear, it's, it's your mind kind of alerting you that it believes there's something to be aware of that could be dangerous or damaging. And so you need to pay attention to it long enough to yeah. evaluate what it's trying to get you to notice. And once you are aware of the situation, you can then, or you should then, if you can, turn, it's, ignore the light <laughs> and then proceed knowing that this is the situation yeah. that I have to confront and deal with. And then you deal with it in a way that isn't full of fear. Um, the fear was just to alert you. And once you're alerted, you don't need to keep feeling fear. The problem. The yeah. Problem, well, I mean, yeah, I guess like, mm -hmm. I'm just saying oh, the, well, the, um, so the problem that I, I have get, with yeah, a I guess, lot of this, I, I don't know if you're, are you listening on the phone or yeah. are you on like a delay? Cause it seems like we're, we're not quite connected. Uh, um, no, I'm, li I'm, li I'm listening on, uh, 
I'm listening on the internet, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the problem that I have. There um, might exist some delay. I don't know. It, it's on definitely mm -hmm. on delay. Uh, or one of us is incredibly awkward. Uh, the uh, the problem that I have with, well, that, with things yeah. like Buddhism and the contemplative efforts and stuff like that is that there are real truths about our brains and our minds and how we interact. There is the realm of psychology. There is the, you know, the, the realm of mental illness and all this other stuff. But what I find is that many uh, varieties of Buddhist mm -hmm. thought and other similar things are desperate to find something more or greater. Yeah. And so the language that they use to describe oh, this okay. is always, it always seems to inflate things. It seems to be, let me paint this metaphoric poetic picture. It seems to be full of deepities, whereas, you know, to the extent that it's true, it's actually trivial to say like, I think that, you know, pain yeah. prevents our use of our imagination. And that may in fact be a deepity. Well, okay, I guess, um, uh, okay, I guess then to be more grounded, I define pain and fear as like biological uh, well are based out of like biology like biological imperatives so we create like the concepts these concepts out of things that are born solely of the body out of like the perception of scarcity but you know we create tools and things to kind of deal with scarcity and you know, like distribution of like resources or whatnot and um in that sense you know scarcity is well, it is a real thing, but it is like you know. I would say, if anything, scarcity a thing seems that to be is overcome by our tools. Thing, but... <laughs> well, well hmm, okay, I don't know. I'm thinking in terms um, though of like fear of well, yeah, I don't yeah, know I fear mean, of somebody yeah. coming after you or whatnot. You know, where it wouldn't necessarily be something scarce. It would be like afraid that someone's like gonna assault you or come get you. Like you know, I was thinking Jews hiding in Nazi Germany or something would have been afraid and, you know. Uh, I don't, I don't, even though things might have been scarce, I don't think that was their biggest Oh well, yeah, fear. that's, yeah, fear, fear of death and scarcity of life, I guess, then. Oh, okay, yeah, you can pretty much oh, define wow. anything as scarcity in those and, terms. And, and now we're into uh, the ability to look at things from different perspectives and to describe it two different ways. But, uh, I, so, yeah. you don't believe there is a God. I, it doesn't seem that you're necessarily buying any, no. into anything supernatural. Yeah, not really. Well, okay. I don't know. There. Uh, well, I guess okay. One one thing that I was thinking about was that like there do exist like th you know abstractions that we have that you know cannot exist really in the natural world. Like well, the, well, like you know, the unmarried, uh, well, the guess, married you know, bachelor. Like... But that, that so you're, you you said there do exist these things that don't exist in the natural world. I think he means as conceptual. We can imagine these things. Yeah. Is that what well, you're saying? Like, okay, but do, okay. do concepts exist as anything other than a brain yeah. state? Um, mm, let's see. Do concepts exist uh, if they exist outside of like space time? I guess. Well, you're t you say that there are these things that you've used both exist and don't exist, and Tracy was asking if you're talking about concepts. But concepts don't exist as well. Things, I mean, right? I guess I'm drawing drawing the idea of like a brain state as you know, biologically based, like you know, sure. kind of thing, and yeah. that <laughs> would be a construct of space time. Right. So I guess I'm but I'm thinking of it. Then are there things that exist outside but, of space time? I then? wouldn't know. How would we know? Yeah, but the thing is, when you say so here's a concept, and then when you acknowledge that a concept is a brain state, and then you're saying that it exists. The brain state is not identical to the concept. Right. The brain state is what produces this experience okay. of having a concept. So the brain state exists, oh, yeah, but our, the concept our, our doesn't. perception of the concept. Okay. Oh, well, I guess I was going to suggest the idea of like, you know, two-dimensional objects, like a circle. Like everyone would agree that circles exist no they don't but they don't exist in nature they don't exist well yeah they don't exist in nature yeah well i mean apart from being a concept the perfect circle well i it... guess I mean, you said I everyone guess, would agree that they exist, like, and i said no they don't I, i'm just kind of curious wait wait what is the what is okay. the point here yeah. <laughs> like where are we going with this 
Oh uh, well, I don't, yeah, I don't really know if there's a point. This is just like some yeah. things I've been. Like, I, I think given that, it's probably to better to philosophers to get a few get a few friends yeah. together and hit a bong and sit around and talk about this <laughs> all you want. Uh, but I'm going to move on to matters related to the. Yeah, and if you come up with show. any kind of pointed question or, or issue, feel free to call again. It reminds me of the, the Animal House. You uh, know, the... <laughs> okay. Cool. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. Well, all right. Bye. All right. All right. You're pretty chill. I'm not sure that was a satisfied customer. I don't know. <laughs> uh, we'll go with uh, Jordan. Thanks for waiting. Hey there. Hey there. Uh, hey, Jordan. A uh, quick thought on, on the earlier call about <laughs> the definition of atheism. Um, or theism. I thought that, yeah. Um, I have noticed that trend to like watching debates uh, that the theists want to keep defining atheism as and what you and I would call anti-theism. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, it's it's like they're just they, they they insist on it, and it's like they're they're really trying hard to just like marginalize the community or something. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and actually, by uh, the way, I'm happy. Uh, on occasions outside of debates with theism to talk about and defend the possibility of an anti-theist position, which I hold, but I don't hold it to absolute certainty. The problem is here, yeah. it's an attempt to shift the burden of proof. They know that they have a burden of proof, and they seem to be aware that they cannot meet it. And yeah. so the best thing they can do is to try to make you look unreasonable, as if you are, yeah. it's, it's almost like a two okay fallacy of, oh, well, yes, I've said there's a God and I can't prove it, but you say there's no God and you can't prove it either, so we're on equal footing, which is bullshit. <laughs> You know, I do want to draw yeah. a distinction, though, between the idea of, like, uh, at a professional debate level, I agree, it's like, shame on you, you should know better. Yeah. But there, I, I remember as a youth, like, being in church and from the pulpit, I can't even tell you how many times I heard that these people believe there is no God. I mean, they tell them that over and over and over, and with so few theists that are open in society in areas where it's very religious, they're not gonna meet many people that are gonna challenge that. So these are people who, that's sure. the only definition they've ever heard for the but, most part. But even part. if that was true, yeah. which in my case it is, and in the case of many other people it is, but in my case it's true in, in very narrow you know, limitations with, the, with these particular usages of the word and this understanding of a degree of confidence, you know, I'm not, even if that was the case, uh, okay, you believe there's a God, I believe there's not a God. How do we figure out which of us is right? And that gets us away from what I personally believe to what is the actual claim and where's the burden proof? How would yeah. you go about demonstrating that God exists? How would you go about demonstrating that no gods exist? And that's fine. Yeah. But I'm thinking yeah, that's probably which, not, that was that probably wasn't the reason you were calling though, right? You were yeah. just hitting that other call. Right, uh, yeah, this, okay. and we're, we're pretty close to talking about that is um, speaking of, you know, uh, beliefs about existence, um, you know, uh, the it, the theists like to say that that belief is a choice, <laughs> and uh, and I know that you've you've said in the in the pe in pre previous episodes, you know, it's not really b beliefs of that nature are not a matter of choice. I don't think we, any beliefs are a choice. Yeah, um, I think uh, at least not on ontological ones. Yeah, I'd yeah, like well, to see one of them just stop believing in God on a dime. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can what you what you profess that you believe, which would have been cool if we could have got to that with the first caller about the difference between what people say they believe and whether or not their actions betray true beliefs. Uh, because I'm yeah. convinced that your actions do betray your true beliefs. The thing is, you can believe a whole bunch of different things, and until those beliefs come in conflict, there you you are probably sincere in saying that this is what I believe. I believe it's wrong to steal. Okay. But there may be situations where you have another belief that overrides it. Yeah. And really, the truth of this is, I believe that it's wrong to steal except under these particular circumstances. It's just you may not be aware of what the circumstances are yet. But at no point uh, do I think anybody, in a simple sense, chooses belief as in, I, today I'm going to believe this. <laughs> or I've decided <laughs> now, like that song, I have decided to follow Jesus. You can decide to the extent that you can decide anything, to take those actions. But if the song were, mm -hmm. I have chosen to believe that Jesus is God, I don't think that that's a choice. Right. I think belief yeah. is the state of accepting it as true. And in all things, you, it is, you are convinced, and that is the result of becoming convinced, not 
you're not convinced by fiat declaration. Right, and and the um, and theists will will often ask, um, what would change our minds, right? What what would convince us? Yep. And so we we have to think up criteria. If you met your burden uh, of proof. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what are the criteria that that you know we have to meet here? And uh, likewise, if the belief itself is is not up to us, then the criteria themselves are also kind of not up to us either, are they? Correct. You could always start with something. You could say, well, if you could demonstrate it to me like I can demonstrate this bottle of water to you, that would be convincing. And then see where they take it. Like, how can, you know what I mean? See how they how mm -hmm. they go around. Then that would, I think, make somebody have to think about how how they would demonstrate it. But I don't, I don't know if it would work or not, but it's something to consider is just to give them something that is you know, plainly demonstrable. It has weight. It can be measured on a scale. It can be, you know, touched. It's tangible. Um, and as God becomes not any of these, then you would, I think, be fair in asking them, okay, then what does your God offer in the way of something that would be demonstrable and measurable? Yeah. And so uh, I think two two criteria that come to mind right away is, is uh, first, you have to understand the the concept and the, the thing and then you have to recognize it in your your own experience and um and that's that's something that uh like my my brother my theist brother likes to uh uh i don't know kind of criticize me for for pointing this out and it's like um why does it why does why do i have to define god for you or whatever because we can't just believe something if we don't understand it first yeah, no, no. They, it's, so if they're claiming that a God exists, <laughs> uh, I yeah. can't have any thoughts about that at the beginning other than what do you mean by God? Right. Because I need to, your definition yeah. of God. Because they're like, well, do you, do you believe, do you, as an atheist, do you not believe in this God or that God? Or I need you to define it. Uh, because somebody could say, hey, my God is that bottle of water. <laughs> and I'm right on yeah. board with that bottle of water existing. And whether or not yeah. it justifies the God label or has any... You know, if somebody says, this is my God, and it can cure your cancer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm willing to believe that this exists. I'm now, now there's a second claim. I'm not sure that it can do what you claim it can do. And I will not worship it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Although when I'm really thirsty, I'll pretend to worship it just long enough to get a drink. Right. And I think the, um, the, uh, the uh, logical, logical coherent thing, it's, it's like, I, I kind of do take the anti-theist position because I don't know of any logically coherent concept of God that also uh, is part of my experience. So um, yeah, it's, when, hard when I take, up, it's, when it's hard I take to think the hard of a logically atheist coherent position. God. Yeah, when I take the hard atheist position, the anti-theist position, I'm quick to acknowledge that I'm not saying there's absolutely nothing anywhere ever at any time that counts as a God. All I'm yeah. talking about are the various gods that people have offered to me throughout my lifetime and that I've read about, you know, and studied from different religions and different propositions. I not only do not believe that they exist, I actually believe they don't exist because we tend to find logical fallacies used in promoting them. We tend to find that the world we experience is not consistent with what that sort of God would produce. If you, the more characteristics you give to your God, the more consequences there are of that. You know, yeah. when, you, when you've defined a God yeah. with these 10 traits, you can then make yeah. predictions from it. Hey, this God loves us and wants us to know he exists, and yet there are people who don't know he exists. That's a problem. That is yeah. the problem of divine hiddenness. The, um, I, I, this, this came up, um, I was taking a uh, alpha course the, what, the Christianity for Beginners thing. Yeah. I talked with, uh, <laughs> last time I was on, I, I talked with Russell and uh, Jen about this. Um, at the last session, I, I came up with this kind of on the spot. I asked uh, the Christians at my table, I asked them, um, what if a divine person, you know, however we want to define that, shows up and they they have these extraordinary abilities we've never seen before, but they don't quite fit your definition of God. Would you believe in that God, or would you insist on on only believing the God that your Bible describes? Yeah. 
and uh, and 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 this sets them up for potentially what I would call idolatry is is worshiping this created thing instead of the creator. I think like most uh, people, I think most of them would be happy to agree, uh, happy to concede that this this agent exists and can do things, but that this despite its claims, it's not actually God or the one true God or whatever. And in that case, really all they're saying is this isn't the God that I'm talking about when I say God. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's funny to imagine like, what if a God showed up? Like there's going to be a whole bunch of people that are going to refuse to acknowledge that God because they, that God <laughs> won't meet their expectations. That's kind of funny. <laughs> God shows up and it's just not what people expect. And so they reject it completely. Yeah. Looks like Alanis Morissette. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, I guess aside from that, uh, I, I think the, the Ark Encounter just opened up. So yeah, we've actually got a caller who's going to talk about the Ark Encounter right now. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll let you get on to them then. Thanks, Thanks Jordan. Jordan. And that should have been enough of a cue for Michael in Russellville to let him know he's, you're on. Oh, hey. Hey, Matt. Hi, Tracy. Hey. So how was the Ark Encounter? Um, it was it was very good. It was a very good experience in my opinion. Um. For those who don't know, there was a group, uh, the Tri-State Freethinkers. Uh, hey, Michael. The Ark Encounter Thursday. I'm sorry? When you say it was a very good experience, are you saying the Ark Encounter was a very good experience or the Ark Encounter protest was a very good experience? Um, the protest was a good experience. Uh, going to the Ark, I think, is a good experience. Also, um, I say this because it gives you, when you, when you go in there, you see, you see how well these people are funded. And you see how deep these ideas are rooted. Um, it gives you an idea of exactly, you know, how far down the rabbit hole these guys have gone. Yeah. And it's just so insanely baseless and disconnected from reality. Um, and I mean, a lot of people might think that, like, the Creation Museum and these these aren't these aren't places that have like little cardboard cutouts of dinosaurs and people. These are really well funded, really well put together oh, yeah. establishments. I think my favorite. And I'm not big on memes, but I, there are on occasion I'll find one I like. My favorite one pointed out that, you know, it took him $100 million, uh, roads, heavy machinery, a massive workforce, and tax incentives from the government. And at no point did he stop and think, hey, wait a minute, could a 500-year-old man really have done this with Bronze Age tools and his two, three sons? Praise God. Well, well, yeah, well, yeah, what's really funny is, uh, see, uh, after the protest, I, we, my, I got, they got a group together. Uh, myself and some of the people, David Somalia from Dogma Debate was in that group. Um, and they took us on a tour with Eric Hovind and the guy who was in charge of all the plaques, like designing all the plaques and what they would say in the building. His name was Tim. I can't remember his last name. Um, but it was him and Eric Hovind and they went through and someone actually asked him about that. And he said, and they, their response was, Noah hired a construction crew. Wait. Eric Hovind said that Noah hired a construction crew? It wasn't Eric Hovind, it was Tim, the, the guy who was in charge of the content of the Ark. Okay, so... He outsourced I, it. <laughs> I'm not aware of anything remotely like that being biblical, uh, but I'm not going to take my, uh, my apologetics or my explanations for outrageous things from the guy who made the plaques. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and what's so interesting is when you go through there, you see all all the different things they've made up. Everything is so – there's so many things that they're so blatantly made up because everywhere there's, like, little disclaimers, artistic liberty here, artistic liberty there, artistic liberty there. <laughs> so I'm, like, curious. Like, which part of this is actually biblical? Okay. I need somebody. Let's get a hold of Evolve Fish because we need artistic liberty stickers to stick in every Bible and every hotel in the world. Yeah. Just boom. <laughs> artistic liberty. That's brilliant. Indeed. Wow. Um, but if I could just take a step back and talk about the actual protest. Absolutely. Um, once, once, we, once I got there, like not even maybe five, ten minutes after I was with my group, uh, I went through with a group from Bowling Green Freethinkers, so shout out to those guys. Yay. Um, right after I got there, Eric Hoven shows up with his merry band of creationists, and he's seriously stood up like on a chair or a stool or something and started yelling at us. Saying, who wants to come debate my constitution expert? He's got, I, he supposedly had a constitutional expert with him. <laughs> I, um, on and on and on. He was yelling at us over and over. Eventually, Owen Raw went over there <laughs> and took a shot at him. Uh, and it was pretty great because Owen Raw had this really great kind of drop the mic moment where he just walked away from Eric because he was done. 
Um, yeah, I, I saw I some video like covering I, I, of Aaron, you know, arguing, debating creationism. I didn't, I didn't see any bit about the constitutional expert. What's, <laughs> what's funny to me is that, you know, to picture Eric standing up there yelling at people who wants to come debate my constitutional expert when there are currently eight constitutional experts on the Supreme Court who fairly consistently tie in a 4-4 split over whether or not something is constitutional. Uh, the fact that some Yahoo can pull out his constitutional expert and then say, who wants to debate him? Uh, you've already failed because that's not the way that constitutional law issues are settled uh, in a debate in front of an ARC replica. Yeah, it was probably someone like David Barton. Yeah. Oh my gosh, <laughs> if, it, if it was David Barton, I would have just, I'd, I'd have drooled myself <laughs> to get at him. And I'm not even a I constitutional expert. I, yeah. I don't know who it was, but he was wearing the same creation, whatever, uh, t-shirt that Erica was. So Did he have a cowboy hat on? No. Uh, then it wasn't David Barton. <laughs> it was kind of a younger guy, probably about the same age as Eric. Cool. Get his um, name so we can make sure he's never a Supreme Court nominee. <laughs> um, I could, I could see if I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but the protest was really well. It was really, really, really a good, a good experience. Um, it lasted about four hours. There were some counter protesters there. There was a lot of people just walking around having discussions. I talked to various creationists while I was there. Uh, all people that Eric brought with him. I was very careful uh, not to talk to Eric actually because he had a lot of cameras. I didn't want to be caught saying anything that he could like cut up and edit to make me sound stupid or whatever. That's smart. Um, because you tend to do that. <laughs> um, there was only maybe a couple times where people got a little crazy and the cops had to step in and say, okay, you got to stop yelling. Uh, so that was pretty good. Which side was told um, to stop yelling or was it both sides? You know, that's, I think it, uh, one guy was, a Christian, he got, he just stood up in front of us and started yelling at us. And then there was this really bizarre instance where this guy pulled up in a green Jeep and stood on top of the Jeep and started yelling at us about two-party democratic system. I, no <laughs> one was sure what he was talking about. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that's like me when I, when I go to a city and I'm doing a talk and I'm talking about logical fallacies or a particular argument from the existence of God and during the Q&A, somebody gets up and just begins to ramble on about how I'm a statist, statism is my religion, and you know, who, who knows, just pass the mic to the next person. I'm convinced you can just put an ISM after anything and then say it disparagingly and make it sound like the person's awful because they subscribe to computerism. Yeah. Well, Facebook is <laughs> It's evil. Indeed. But I think um, it brings up a good point, though. I mean, when you go to see something like that and you see the amount, like you're talking about the amount of resource that went into producing this thing, and that's, I think that's the thing that kills me almost as much as the influence that religion has on the society is how much wasted human resource goes into just nothing. I mean, it's nothing. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's really, it's, I mean, it was $73 million uh, to build the ark, I believe. Put that toward a cancer um, cure. You know what I mean? It's, it, it just, this, if, it, if, if people didn't believe this stuff, that resource and that money, I mean, I'm not going to say that I know it would go to something good. It could go to a horrible war. You know what I mean? I don't know. But at least that's yeah. one thing it's not just being thrown away on. You know, we'd have, at least have another, a a less, less of a chance that it, it would be put towards something that was not really conducive to helping things. I think if there's another ARC protest or if anybody actually goes there, I think any atheists who go to the ARC encounter, we should get t-shirts that are, uh, sell all your belongings and give the money to the poor, the instruction from Jesus, and then have a picture of the ARC with the dollar amount below yeah. it. Uh, for anybody walking through there because, you know, while well, you're free to do whatever you want with your money, back when there was the Explore God movement thing was in Austin, they were putting up these billboards that were many thousands of dollars. The local news came and interviewed me to ask me what I thought about it, and I wasn't giving them the answer they were looking for. And eventually he just kind of coaxed me in, into it, and he's like, well, don't you really think the, these billboards are a waste of money? And uh, I acknowledge, yes, my perspective, that the money could be put to some better use. However, this individual gets to decide how they use their money. And we could, we put up billboards. The money we use to put up billboards might have a better use. We're not sure. Right. Um, so I'm supportive of their freedom. To do, I, Ken Ham is perfectly free to do this, although he sure. shouldn't be getting tax benefits from the government to do this. Um, but 
I think it's also fair to point out that, you know, you, you raised $73 million so that you could build a boat on dry land that wouldn't float and isn't representative <laughs> of anything and sh should yeah. only teach the lesson that the Bible story is, in fact, impossible. And instead, you could have used that money and put it towards medical research, feeding the homeless. You could probably, you know, fixed and just donate it straight to Kentucky instead of taking their tax Or like breaks. you said, put the money towards something that your God told you to put it toward. Yeah. That you believe your God said to put it toward. I mean, why is this even hard? God didn't ask you to go make an ark replica. If you, if you stick with the, <laughs> the Gospels, it's go ye therefore unto all the world, unto, unto all the nations preaching. How are you going to go anywhere in a boat that's stuck on land? Yeah. You can't go anywhere. <laughs> This is not homage to God. This is homage to Ken Ham. Yeah. This is Ken yeah, going, yeah, look how God didn't cool ask I him am. to do this. There's nothing in the Bible instructing him to build an ark encounter. And are they going to have an ark week? Yeah, is it just the ark Sorry? encounter? I, I was just wondering if they're doing ark encounter, uh, are they going to do ark week? I, on, yeah, put it on the History Channel <laughs> right up against Shark Week. Hey, it's ark week. Yeah. And uh, we're going to run it for 40 days and 40 nights instead of a week. Ugh. Well, it actually kind of funny you said the 40 days and 40 nights because they actually have a special for the first 40 days and 40 nights that's open. They're going to actually oh uh, open, open the arc from 9 p.m. to 12. So they're having a special like midnight arc encounter for the first 40 days and 40 nights. Because the boat looks better in the dark. Yeah. I, th wow. This whole thing, you know, I, I would say 40 days, 40 nights is the, is the over-under on when this thing goes bankrupt. I don't well, know. That, that, that's the thing. That's the thing because you go there, at least my experience, and the parking lot's quite empty. Um, oh no! <laughs> there is not that many people there, uh, in in compared to what they show that they're prepared to hold. Um, well, that's everything on and, earth, right? <laughs> I mean, they're gonna hold it yeah. all. They, well, but they, if the, the you boat can only take two of every it. species. So. But if you build it, they will come, right? I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, to <laughs> me, the first days of this. It absolutely should have been packed, and it wouldn't have surprised me to find that it was packed because churches should have been bussing everybody into this like they do for, you know, the God's Not Dead movies and stuff like that. The, if, yeah, yeah. if the ark opening and you guys are there for the protest and the parking lot looks largely empty and they're getting nowhere near the crowds that they were expected on opening day, uh, it might go belly up in less than 40 days. Well, and that's, we should have a pool. that's where I'm almost like mixed because Ooh, yeah like, I don't want this thing to be successful but the problem is if it doesn't if it's not successful then they get 18 million dollars you know to try to shore up you know their following project yeah so they get tax and breaks going in tax breaks state. going out wow what a scam sweet yeah. deal and right. uh I mean and, and there's a lot of people are even around that area that aren't happy because I read an article where like uh, some farmers are upset because the land that, that's that all this is built on got sold to them for ten dollars. Yeah, so and they have uh, they have hiring practices that were uh, that were uh, illegal. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah it's so, a big mess. So, so, so the hiring practices. Uh, anyone who applies has to sign a statement of faith and yeah. a statement of chastity if you're unmarried. Wow. Cool. I've got the belt. Anyway, thanks for calling um, and let us know about the Ark Encounter. I'm wow. going to try to get to a few more callers before we're done here today. Uh, I'm glad there were people there standing up for reason. All right, man. Thank thanks. you. Take it easy. Yep. All right. We've got Ram in New Delhi. Yes. Hello. Hello, hi. Ram. Yeah. Hi. You guys, guys can hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I have uh, a burden of proof about evidence for God. So, you know, I have some sort of that thing, a oh, video. Okay. It's related to reincarnation. That's what we believe in. So how does so, reincarnation tie to, I mean, even if you could prove that reincarnation happened, which I'm, I'm not convinced of, but how does uh, that prove a God exists? Well, basically what uh, Western, uh, what Christianity teaches is that Jesus died and he died on the cross and he resurrected three days after. Yeah. So we believe in karma and the concept that if we do good unto others, uh, we will be reborn again. The concept that uh, this is a cyclical life. And uh, so uh, reincarnation is the ultimate prize. It's one of the ultimate prize. The ultimate prize being uh, getting rid of the cycle of life and death and transcending to God. But uh, reincarnation is a secondary 
uh, corollary it it comes after uh, when you have done good but not enough good so you might be reincarnated as a bee or you might be reincarnated as you know another person that's what the videos are about the link which i sent you it contains a very scientific uh, list of cases that have been identified over the years uh, which have shown clearly over and over again that uh, there have been situations where people have reincarnated into other people and now they remember about their past lives and uh, so it ties in with our belief system so that's why i believe it so you believe it because it ties into your belief system and that is such an extraordinary claim it's such an extraordinary claim that uh, which is why so i'd love to hear cases. the extraordinary evidence for it but yeah so i emailed you that i, I, I don't know you. what email you're talking about uh, tv at uh, atheist community? yeah I, I that doesn't mean i read or got the email okay i'm sorry about that i'm sorry that's my fault well no you probably you did send it correctly that. but we get tons of email so oh, i'm sorry i'm that's sorry, sorry. But so I guess Matt's time. question, though, is let's let's say that we have a mm -hmm. case where a person um, comes back and let's I mean, I mean, first of all, I'm not sure how you would demonstrate they're reincarnated. So if somebody has okay, so if they I, let's I, say I, they remember I, that they are able to tell me about someone who lived previously. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do I know that means they were the person? OK, so first of all. Uh, what this video majorly entitles is that people who do suffer, who have uh, reincarnation, who claim that they are reincarnated, first of all, they, whenever they uh, they start speaking about reincarnation, the first time they can speak, that's the that's the only thing they know, the only memories right. they have. Right, but how do we know they're correct? Okay, so uh, the doctor who did all the research on that, uh, he had created all these case studies, uh, he, he had uh, uh, done all these case. Uh, uh, possible uh, interpretations of the case mm -hmm. so uh, many of them uh, included fraud and uh, something like crypto amnesia that the person might have uh, you know learned the fact from somewhere and then might have forgotten it or he's making it up and uh, or he's creating fraud but then he also had uh, some um, many 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 cases that uh, related to the fact that the person who died shared a birthmark uh, with the injury that uh, caused him the death so if the injury was so horrific that uh, okay, the yeah. I'm super skeptical created. of this. Um, yes, I, I, I think know, I, know. I think that if it was correct, that there would be far more scientific consensus agreeing that it's correct. I know, I know. But once you once you understand how it works, so there are so <laughs> right. many. Types how come of scientists species? don't understand how it works? Well, I'll tell you why. Because there are so many types of species, right? and uh, a human can be reincarnated into anything so the probability of being reincarnated into another human is very very less and uh, what's further less is the fact that uh, you might be reincarnated but you might not remember it right but you're saying that this person has convincing evidence and i'm saying that science is not convinced this is correct so yeah, why aren't he, they convinced yeah, I know. He, even he wasn't fully convinced. No, but he, he, uh, I guess eventually he was, though. But I'm saying, were his peers also convinced? Because I am unaware of this being a scientific well, he consensus. he died in 2000. Yeah, he died but his in research, I mean, his data would still be available for review. Right? Yes, it is. It, it is up for review. OK. For review. And, and so if this is not currently a scientific consensus that I'm aware of, is that correct? Yes. OK, so this is not current scientific fact what do you what do you define current i mean i'm the, saying that right now that right day. now and this science, is not considered to be being, this is not considered by any this, branch of this science this video is before 2007 by the way that's and, fine uh, I, i'm trying to say that this person's research does not appear to have influenced the scientific community of peers that what he has presented uh, should be evidence of reincarnation well, I have to read about that if it, if it had been... Uh, Don't you think what, people what, would know if this was considered to be a scientific fact? If, if they said, yes, this, this is correct, and what his research is undeniably, well, you know, ironclad, well, it's very good, and, and we believe well, that... Well, people once thought that, this, uh, Earth, uh, that the sun is the center of the universe, so what do people know, right? <laughs> Wait a 
a minute, though. I mean, if we're trying to establish what, what should be believed and we're saying that science mm -hmm. is not accepted this evidence, um, mm -hmm. then I, I don't understand. It's like it, you're saying that we should accept it without a vetting. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I've heard the show before, and you're using those same arguments that you use all the time. Yeah, uh, <laughs> because it makes sense to say, how has this been verified? And you're saying this man but, did all the research, and this man did all the verification to his it's satisfaction. It's, it's a team of people. It's a okay, team of well, people. his team then. But what I'm saying is that whatever he presented so far has uh -huh. not been convincing to any scientific field that I'm aware of that has adopted this as a scientific like consensus of their field. Is that not uh, ex correct? Yeah, extraordinary claims require extraordinary amounts of evidence. Well, yeah. but you can produce extraordinary evidence. Like you said, you can yeah. convince people and, that the sun is that, not the center of the universe. And, and that is what has been shown in the video. But it then how come the scientific community is not convinced by this information? I am not a researcher in the reincarnation, so I can't really comment on that. What I can say is that uh, I feel that this video is important enough that people will be inspired to do more research on it. And people do have, have right. done more research on and it. And when so they come most, to the decision cases, that this is scientifically valid, then we will have something to discuss. But right now you have somebody that's putting forward a hypothesis for um, information that they have gathered, which I don't know that it's been actually, it, so it doesn't seem that there's been peer review to the extent that they have accepted this as convincing. No, it has been peer reviewed. It has been peer reviewed. Then how? Okay, let me tell you. How did the peer uh, review not? The, <laughs> it, it, the, the problem. The, there's a problem here, um, uh -huh. and that is, we have information, and we have a bunch of facts, and we want an explanation for why this is the case. Why mm -hmm. is it that somebody seems to be able? to recall a past life, okay? Yes. How do you yes, determine what the correct explanation for that is? Because yeah. is it possible that in some of these cases, these are false memories? Yes, okay. it is possible. It, so that's a possibility. We're aware that the brain is a weird thing and it makes mistakes. So we know that that's a possibility. Yes. Is it possible that these people were really incarnate, really reincarnated? Well, no, <laughs> that, that's a very loaded question there. Yes, I it's think very loaded. Are, and you think they're not. I think they are and you think they're not. Okay, they're I, I understand. Be... I understand you think that that's the explanation and I am not convinced yet that that's the explanation. But what I asked okay. is, is it possible that they were reincarnated? Yes, it's possible. How do you know it's possible? Well, because uh, our culture has been the theorizing about reincarnation for the past uh, 5,000 years. So the and human human beings have been theorizing about all kinds of things, including infinite I energy don't. for a I long time. But that doesn't mean that it's possible just because we've been thinking about it. Yeah, but I haven't seen a proof for infinite energy as of yet. But I have seen a proof. I have seen evidence that can... Uh, you know, push person to that direction if he's. No, now uh, we're back to talking about. Of, we're back to talking about what you're convinced of, and all I'm asking about is how did you determine that reincarnation is possible? Because I know of no mechanism by which one okay, so, could demonstrate that it is possible. No, I even don't know the mechanism. I think if okay, I knew the mechanism. So you think it's possible, and you're not aware of any mechanism to demonstrate that it's possible. Why? Well, the only mechanism that I know is uh, karma. But, That's okay, how, how, how do you demonstrate that karma is true? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now that is a... Uh... I mean, we know yeah. that, we know that if, if the, I... that we know that the simple version of karma um, is not true is with, within, within a given lifetime, that you could live a good life and do lots of good things and just have nothing but a miserable life with bad things. We know that that's possible. And this is why people have theorized about, well, if you didn't get your just well, rewards that's in, because, in that's this because life. Good is, that is, that's because good is such a uh, weird word. Well, I mean, you, I, you, I wait, here's a question. Is mm -hmm. it possible that reincarnation could happen and, and it could happen using a mechanism that doesn't involve a god? Mm, yes, certainly. Okay, then how certainly. is reincarnation uh, proof of God? Hey, I think I said that at the beginning. You did. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, well, 
now that there's the label god there which you use label god and uh, you know what i've seen from talking with people is that the people from the west have a very different view of god i mean you people don't like authority that much i i'm telling you any feel... any god see if you if you could prove mm -hmm. reincarnation you would only prove reincarnation you wouldn't prov prove that it's because of a god unless you could prove a mechanism unless you can show a connection yeah. to that but we're at this problem we're at this point now where you can't demonstrate the truth of karma you can't demonstrate the, the, the possibility even of reincarnation. You can just accept it, but you, you have mm -hmm. no mechanism by which to demonstrate that it's possible. And yet, mm. I, I understand you're convinced of it. And there are plenty of people that are convinced of things. Perhaps they have good reasons yes. that they're not able to communicate or that I'm not aware of. And perhaps mm -hmm. they have bad reasons. So is it possible that you become convinced by bad reasons? Well, I say that uh, the only reason why I was convinced by reincarnation was A, because of the evidence. Second, that uh, the most popular theory of unified field physics, which is uh, a theory of the multiple universe model, you know, it somehow, uh, it, 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 uh, it, it is compatible with reincarnation. And uh, uh, so, thirdly, okay, hang on, because I was going to ask mm -hmm. if you were an expert in this and why we always seem to take a turn towards let me find something in science that I can make fit, but you just use the, the perfect words. The fact that your model or your what the thing that you believe is compatible mm -hmm. with a particular scientific theory is utterly irrelevant. If it was incompatible with what we know to be the truth, then then your position would be falsified. But the fact that it's compatible with it doesn't sorry, mean I'm that sorry, it's I, true. I cannot understand. I, I couldn't understand you. Okay. Here's a scientific theory, and I, I believe something which is compatible with that. Does that mean the thing that I believe is true? No, not necessarily. Okay, so what do, why would you then point to the, the fact that your belief in reincarnation is compatible with unified field theory? Well, because uh, if, you, if, you want to, if you want to prove something big, then you have to have more lines of evidence with other fields. Well, I would agree, but you just acknowledge that this isn't an actual line of evidence, that there's not necessarily a connection. The fact that something is compatible with it, uh, with another thing, doesn't mean that, that it's true. Yeah, but it certainly allows a, a, allows a need for more thinking about it, right? Absolutely. I completely agree. It, it, it requires a lot more thinking, which is to say that we should not accept that it's true. We should continue to think about it until such time as there's and, an actual uh, yeah, demonstration. And finally, uh, the last thing is that I think... I swear I didn't hang up on him for We comment. didn't touch I, it. <laughs> and my fingers are nowhere near the button. Is it, the show's still on the line, right? Like line yeah. five is still on. Yeah, it's on. still on. So it's a thing on his end. Maybe he's the one doing the joke. But no, finally, I think he was serious. The last thing, I'll hang up on you. Because that could be a joke, but no. Um, all right. So uh, we got about 20 minutes or so left in the show, 18 I, minutes left I in the show. I actually think that was the th I mean, I might be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I think that was the thing that Sam Harris was on about at one point where he had like footnotes in his one of his books about, you know, being convinced about this stuff or thinking that it was valid for a while. I So in the end of faith and in a number of discussions, Sam has shown a fondness for... Uh, lines of inquiry into these sorts of things. And I don't know exactly what his position is. And by the way, I don't care. I mean, it, apart from right. your curiosity, what Sam Harris thinks about something on its own doesn't affect me. Um, I know that there's all kinds of really cool stories. Right. You know, here's this six-year-old who starts speaking in a language that they've never heard. The it's well, very difficult to verify the facts yeah. about that. The problem with me is you cannot keep this person in a box from day one to day, you know, six years. And so at that point where you have to acknowledge that you have not, I mean, that this kid has been left with nannies or babysitters or Aunt, you know, Elvira, a whoever. Television. Took, yeah. So you don't know. A Rosetta know, Stone DVD. You don't know what the child has been exposed to because the, nobody has followed them around, you know, their entire lives to make sure that they are in a lab environment where they're completely controlled. Yeah, the, the, the possibility for a good <laughs> test methodology on this is very, very difficult. And so where science relies on inference and induction like we do the rest of our lives, um, we don't hold those views as strongly as those things that are 
supported by good yeah. evidence and deductive reasoning and able subject to replication and, yeah. and falsification. And if all you're doing is looking for things to substantiate what you believe and just picking the pieces that are like, oh, you know, like he mentioned at one point that there were similar scars to like people that had lived in the past and been injured or something. And it's like, if you're going to just simply look for the, the compatibilities, it reminds me of when we did the dice thing and you were throwing them and just, just grabbing the fives. We'll just yep. grab the fives and we'll ignore the, the rest of them. And it's, that's not how you falsify a thing by saying, you know, oh, look at this scar he has. And that's like a scar that was described from this other person in, that they injured themselves in their other life. It's like you have to make like real predictions about what you're going to find. And then those predictions have to be indicative of the mechanism that you're suggesting. And so then we haven't gotten to any of those things. I mean, we haven't gotten to that <laughs> point. But let's, for the sake of argument, give a full on benefit of the doubt. Yeah. It's just a thought experiment. Here is a child. We'll, we'll set it up like the Truman Show. Every minute of this child's <laughs> life has been monitored, and we've watched him grow. And at the age of six, he just starts speaking a language that he's never been exposed to, and we can confirm that. And he tells stories that are somewhat consistent with things that took place in the past that he has not been exposed to. We'll just say that all of that is confirmed, which is much stronger than anything anyone has ever offered for reincarnation. How can you reasonably conclude that the best explanation for those events is that he is reincarnated from something? How do you know that, for example, he's not getting messages from aliens and angels? How do you know that um, we haven't stumbled onto some new X-Men mutation with, you know, genetic memory? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think all of those things are preposterous, and we, we, we will probably never have to face this particular scenario <laughs> because we never get that far. But even if we had it, even if it was like, bam, 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 the truth is when you say it has to be reincarnation, what you're really saying is I can't think of anything other than reincarnation that would account for this, which doesn't tell us anything at all about whether or not reincarnation is the cause or right. whether it's real. It tells us about your failure to imagine other possibilities and your willingness to leap on the first explanation that seems compatible with it or consistent with it, but not necessarily the cause. Yeah. We are blocked. I, the reason I don't believe in the supernatural isn't because I decided, oh, nope, nothing supernatural <laughs> exists. It's because we have no mechanism to investigate and confirm it. As yeah. soon as we do, as soon as there's a mechanism, I'm on board. And the, and the same is true for reincarnation. So it's not that I'm saying, oh, your, your answer is wrong. I'm saying your answer is not justified by the evidence available and what we understand about reality. You've got to do more work. Maybe reincarnation's a thing. Maybe a god's a thing. Yeah. And it, and it is telling, though, I mean, the idea that when, when you're convinced of something like this and the evidence has been presented and the case studies have been presented and I'm not aware but he said this has been peer reviewed and I'm like but it's not adopted as consensus in any field that I'm aware of so if it has been peer reviewed it's been peer reviewed and rejected well it, I mean I don't know what else to say it's if it were peer reviewed and accepted we, we talk a lot about peer review but peer review is not magic Right, but you can peer review a thing and it can be rejected as yeah, like, it can true. be criticized hotly. It also depends on where the peer review is done, who the peers were. I sure, mean, sure. The quality of, of the journal, for example, that you submit to the, has a lot to do. The real do. proof in the pudding isn't just, oh, it's been submitted to a peer reviewed right. journal and accepted because we know there are things, lots and lots of things that have been submitted and accepted to peer reviewed journals that turned out to be bunk, um, the, this so-called paper, et cetera. Um, but the real test of a model of understanding is now that we have tentatively accepted this based on the evidence what predictions does it make right. and continue to bear out and then it can then it, it develops a longevity the reason that you know we accept evolution isn't just because somebody found a fossil and we went with it or somebody <laughs> dated the earth and we went with it or somebody wrote a peer reviewed paper about evolution it is because the model of natural selection that method consistently and continually bears out and makes predictions, not only about predictions about things that would change with regard to uh, bacterial morphing, et cetera, but predictions of what we can find out about the past, where we, you know, if evolution is true, if our current model is accurate, then in this particular rock strata, which represents a particular age of the earth, we should find a creature of this type. And that's where we go out and we look and we find Tiktaalik. That is the sort of thing where a robust scientific 
explanation for something actually has teeth. And while I agree with what you're saying, I just want to point out the inverse of that, though, which is what I was aiming at, the idea that if it has been submitted for peer review and it's not been adopted as consensus, yeah. then, I mean, we got nowhere to go. Basically, what you're saying is that people looked at this to vet it and it's not been accepted. That it reminds so, me of, I mean, of the I people know. on YouTube who, who will say, oh, I challenged Matt Dillon to a debate and he never answered me. And their challenge is their own YouTube video with 35 views that I never saw. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you submitted the challenge to YouTube. If I never got it, uh, we're not going to have a debate. But it's just, I mean, when that, the idea that this would be meaningless, the idea that somebody would say this person did all this research and it's all available, it's mm -hmm. all published, it's all, you know, out, out there online for anybody to access. And it's like, and which scientific community has adopted this as their reality? Not one. So that should make you question whether or not you're actually evaluating this evidence well. Yeah. It's, it's kind of the thing of, you can look at all this evidence yourself. Yeah, you can. And my question is, what conclusion do you draw from it and why? Um, and if your best reasons why are it's compatible with this or it's what we've always taught or people have been thinking about this for thousands of years, um, th those aren't reasons to accept a particular explanation. But. All right, so we've got uh, Diana who's been on hold. Thanks for waiting. Hi. Hi. Hey. Um, so, I wanted to uh, talk about <laughs> definitions. <laughs> oh, definitions. Cool. We're back uh, to the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, what, um, okay. So, this is the idea that I'm trying to put out there. Um, the words, words like atheist and atheism have different definitions uh, in English and, for example, in Romanian. My yep. uh, my native language, and uh, the difference is pretty disturbing. So I didn't, I didn't research the definition in Romanian until now because all the research that I, I done, I done in English. So when it was time to talk to my parents, I said, okay, let's let's search definition. So if I can read them to you, sure. Okay, atheist is. A person who denies the existence of God and any other deity. Yep. I'm Follower here. of atheism. Uh, the the weird thing is says the follower of atheism. The weird so, thing is the what? It says a follower of atheism. Oh, a follower of atheism. Yeah, that's that's yeah. I don't know what they'd be following. So one well, of the things one of the things to remember. One of the things to remember is that dictionaries are written by people and they describe they Main, their main use, I think, is to tell you how to spell words correctly. But they describe how words are used, and words are going to have different usages. And they're not, it's not like the person who sat down and wrote the dictionary definition for atheist for any dictionary is actually an atheist or a philosopher or an expert on the subject. They're just describing how people use the word. And so you're going to get a lot of things. First of all, I do deny the existence of gods. Uh, in the sense that I deny that the claims that a god exists have met their burden of proof. Uh, but I'm not a follower of atheism because there's nothing to follow, but that's not something I would necessarily expect a dictionary uh, to get right. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important to keep doing stuff like this, because those dictionaries can be updated. And if we, if we continue to work on the public perception of this so that there is a much more clear understanding of how these terms are used, then the dictionaries will get better as well. But if the words ever get in the way of actually talking about what you mean, you can yeah. throw the word out. Okay, let's not talk about me as an atheist. I, I don't follow an atheism. Uh, all I mean is I don't believe a God exists. You can call that Fergal Burgle if you want to. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, why they say a follower of atheism is because atheism is described as a doctrine based on the denial of God and any other deity. Yep. So my concern is uh, with people that don't have uh, atheist uh, friends uh, and they just research this on their own and they might reach some wrong conclusion. And uh, I don't know how we would be the best way to approach this is just to redefine words whenever you 
talk to somebody, just explain what it means to you. Yep. And to get more well, and more people doing it. Yeah, I guess well, I mean, true. you can always point out the idea that there are different definitions that different groups use, right? I mean, like we looked it up with this gentleman that was on the call earlier today, and there were two definitions in the in the um, online dictionary that I pulled up on Google, and there were two definitions on the definition that he pulled up. And what you're saying is that when you go into Romanian sources, you see these very, very staunch, like um, you know, strong theist uh, atheist. Uh, perceptions of the definition, but I think it's fair to point out to people that globally this is not the only definition that people use, a, you know, a range of definitions, all of which include disbelief and some of which include denial as well. And I think that's fair to say, yes, a person that denies the existence of God is an atheist. And that person also does not believe. And every atheist does not believe. Some if, if of you... them also deny. It, yeah, if you search, I'm sure there's probably a hundred websites and, and maybe even a real place that's called the Church of Atheism. Uh, yeah. I absolutely despise that. I think it's beyond moronic. But the truth of the matter is, not believing in a God doesn't mean that you are necessarily smarter. It doesn't mean, mean that you have good ideas. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't Take that and turn. I could turn. I could create an, a, a religion out of non-belief by adding things to it. Um, I think that's a horrible mistake, uh, but it's possible. Would that mean then that I am now the? You know, we're we're getting into no true Scotsman fallacy territory. Uh, is my Church of Atheism the one true Church of Atheism? Is it the only way to be atheisty? And the problem with this is that we're generally lazy. Um, religion isn't one thing. It's many, many, many things. Christianity isn't one thing. Protestantism isn't one thing. Baptist isn't one thing. But we use the labels as shorthands, and the labels are only effective if we both mean the same thing by them. And apart from that, we need to throw it out. And at the minimum, you can say, okay, fine, you know, here's what I mean by atheism. But if, if, if there's too much of a roadblock for you to entertain the possibility uh, to discuss things using the terms in the way I do. Let's come up with a new term. And, and it's fine, because I don't care what people call themselves. I care about what they actually believe in and what they do on behalf of those words. I see. That's, uh, that's a very good point. Thank you for the explanation. And I want to add one more thing. Mm -hmm. um, I hope you guys understand how much you help, you help ideas. Oh, Especially you. when they're new ideas and when they try to talk to their family, you offer so many explanations through your calls, and we just uh, we don't look like lost, confused puppies in front of our religious families. Thank you, thank you so much, and I'm glad it's. Any, if anything we've ever said here has been helpful to somebody, that's yeah, a win. That's so. the whole point. Appreciate it. Um, uh, this is a quick question from Sterling, in Amsterdam. Hi there. Hey. Hey. Um. Yeah, it's a quick question. Um. What's the um, best or most interesting reasoning for an evolution compatible fall of man you've heard from Christians that accept evolution? I'll take my answer uh, off the air. Okay. I don't know of any. I, I don't know of any either. <laughs> I've never heard it. I don't know if you've encountered one or more, but generally when you throw out the literal creation, I don't know how you deal with the fall. So, first of all, creationism comes in a number of different forms. Uh, young earth, old earth, day age. Um, now, Catholics generally accept the science of evolution. Uh, and, and original sin. And original sin. <laughs> and the, the truth of the matter is, is that these two don't go together. And what they're accepting is yeah, we understand that this is what science says and we're okay with all that, but we're, we think something else happened as well, uh, that there were, you know, that these stories are at least somewhat true or maybe metaphorically true. But one thing I've learned about Catholics is that they love the word mystery. <laughs> and so they probably view it as a mystery. And there's this, there's this saying, which I'm not going to get correct, which is about 
uh, a demonstration of, of genius or, or uh, amazing intellect of being able to hold two mutually contradictory positions in your mind at one time, that's a crock of shit. If you accept two things that are mutually exclusive, that's cognitive dissonance. And what you're doing is engaged in self-deception. And the best you can do is say, well, I kind of believe this one and I kind of believe this one, or today I'm convinced of this, but I think there might also be this. And you're probably engaged in some hyperbole. You're probably saying, I'm not necessarily ruling out the possibility that God you know, came in and diddled with DNA to, to move things along the track. I know evolution doesn't require that, but you know God's magic and he can do anything. And, and so you basically just come up with all these little excuses to exaggerate so that you don't have to let go of the belief that you have that you don't have a good reason for. But, and we got one last caller. As a reminder, folks involved in the show get together and go to dinner. Uh, Thread Gills, they'll have that up there on the bottom. Uh, and I have an announcement before I forget. Um, I'll have more details uh, a little later, but they just put up the uh, promotional material for it. November 6th in Vancouver um, will be an evening with Richard Dawkins and me uh, sitting there just the two of us chatting in front of people, so uh, I'll, I'll get information on where you can go to find more details on that later, but uh, looking forward to it, and hopefully it's not too crazy cold in Vancouver in November, but pretty sure we'll have it indoors. But. <laughs> Simeon, thanks for waiting for the entire show. You had a question. Yes, uh, I've been thinking about knowledge lately, and I've heard you say on the show a couple of times that the traditional definition of knowledge of justified true belief uh, you don't like that definition too well. Is that still your feelings? Yeah, I, I'm generally okay with it. I think it has problems, and those problems have been pointed out by philosophers all over the place because, you know, what counts as justification, and how did you go about verifying that it was true? So to say that knowledge is justified true belief um, might just be a bit of grandstanding. Okay. So do you, do you have maybe a better definition? That's kind of my question. So I did a lecture on belief and knowledge years ago, and I've pretty much stuck by this because what I'm talking about is not knowledge in the sense of epistemology, the one that philosophers are, are you know, constantly wrestling with and can we come up with a better definition. I was talking about knowledge in the way it's more commonly used by people when they say, I know this, I know that. And in that case, um, essentially you're expressing a level of confidence you know, hey, I believe this, but, you know, maybe just kind of barely believe it. But if you really, 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 really believe it, you're, you're convinced, uh, you tend to call it knowledge. And so the, the definition that I came up with uh, that was sort of a, a work in progress is belief is the acceptance of a proposition as true or likely true. And knowledge is acceptance of a proposition to such a degree that it would be world changing to discover that it was false. You know, I... I know that I am on, I know that I'm in this room with Tracy. If I were to discover that, th <laughs> that this information was false, that would shatter my understanding of the world. It's, it's not a declaration that I'm absolutely correct because, you know, hey, this, how do I know it's not all a delusion? It's just an exp explanation of if you flip a coin, I'm, I'm convinced that it's going to fall, you know, on one of the two sides. It might hit an edge. There's a Twilight Zone episode of that where the coin lands on the edge. Anyway, um, but yeah. I'm, 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 I'm convinced of what the probabilities are. I know that for a fair coin, because the definition of fair coin is this, that there's a 50% chance of it landing on either side. I know, also know that we don't tend to have fair coins. We've tested this. Um, there are things that it would seem impossible for me to discover that it was false. And this is where I talked about uh, maximal certainty with regard to esoteric names and labels. So if we define a coin, a fair coin, as one which has a 50% chance of landing heads or tails, that is inviolable. There's no way that can't be true because we've just defined it. It doesn't matter whether the coin exists. We've just said this is the case and, and it's just a declaration. The knowledge, experiential knowledge, um, I know that the earth orbits the sun. We didn't always have that information. We do now. I am, not only do I just, I, I believe it, but I am so convinced of it that if we were to discover that the Earth does not orbit the sun, that would shatter my understanding of, of reality, at least with respect to that area. And I think that's what most people mean when they talk about knowledge, which is why I don't care that much when they say, I know this, because mm -hmm. I understand they're just expressing a confidence level, 
And all I really care about is do you believe it? Because if you believe it, you will act in accordance with it. If you believe it incredibly strongly, you're probably more likely to act in accordance. But if you believe it, you're past the 50% mark at all, you're always going to act in accordance with that belief. Okay. So you're okay with kind of discarding the concept of knowledge from an epistemological standpoint? No, I'm not, I wouldn't discard it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of philosophers and philosophy, and I think that there is a lot of value in continuing to explore issues of epistemology. Uh, but I, I'm in a different realm. I, I'm in the realm of what people are convinced of and why. And knowledge isn't uh, a concern of mine because I look at knowledge as basically just an expression of confidence. And while that's interesting, it's not the key. The key is what are you convinced of, no matter what degree you're convinced of it? Uh, and what are you not convinced of? Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's pretty, pretty good. Um, I just want to say uh, a good job on your on your talk at the uh, Apologetics Academy. I don't know if you remember me from there. Oh, okay. Thank, thanks so much. I, yeah, I posted the video of that. It's like three hours long, uh, and I thought I was it just is. I was going to get nothing but I thought I was going to get nothing but complaints. But uh, so far, the feedback's been really positive, and I was really happy to have that uh, that discussion. So. No, it was really great. The last guy you talked to, Jason, he's been my my debating nemesis on Facebook for like the last year. <laughs> well, cool. All right, thanks, Evan. All right, cool. That's the end. That's the end of the show. That's the end of the callers. I don't Darn, know what's going on there. That was probably the somebody calling. Oh, somebody was trying to call in the last second. Um, I don't think I'm on next week. I don't. I don't, I don't know, know for sure. I'd have to check the calendar. Who knows? If not, I'll probably take a week off anyway. But. Uh, Thanks to everybody who Thread showed gills. up. Where? Thread yep, three girls. So I just said that one a minute ago. It's live TV. Yeah. We can do anything on live TV. Oh, no, I won't. Thanks to everybody who showed up. There's a whole studio audience out there on the other side of the glass. Uh, and, and thanks to the guys in the booth for making yes, the show happen. thank you. And uh, while I may or may not be here next week, somebody awesome will be here and the show will be probably better. So, Even bye -bye. awesomer. More, more awesomer. <laughs>